All right, folks, it is the eve of your digital AP Lit exam, and I am Tim Freitas with the Garden of English, and I am here with the most awesome Gina Cordum. Did I say that correctly, by the way? You did. Awesome, and I am so thrilled that you are indeed here. I'm going to ask that if there's anybody tuning in that you actually will type into the chat, tell us where you're coming from. Um, and then please note that what we're going to do is tonight we're going to just go through strategies that we tell our kids, you know, last minute cram sessions for the AP Wood exam. And we're going to say, hey, here's what we like to do with our kids. Here are tips for all that we have going on. Um, and if you have questions about anything, toss it in the chat. Please know that even if the same question comes up over and over, we will interrupt what we're doing. And although it might get a little obnoxious to us at times because we're like, oh, man, we just answered that. You know, we know that you all tune in at different times. So toss your questions in the chat. Please make sure that you are uh, willing to talk to us. And we want to give you all that we can indeed give you. Let me just check my sound here. There it is. My sound is working. Gina, it sounds like you're coming through loud and clear. So we should be all set. So welcome here, uh, Los Angeles, California. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. We appreciate you. Um, and um, Apex, North Carolina, and Maine. Good. We've got, look at, we've already got the coasts represented here, Gina. So I'm, I'm thrilled and honored that all of you would come to actually listen to us. Dartmouth, Massachusetts, by the way, just a quick little shout out there. Uh, I used to live in New Bedford and I did my student teaching in Dartmouth. So for those of you in Dartmouth, Massachusetts, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, Gina, tell us about where you're from and then we'll get into this. I'm coming to you from St. Paul, Minnesota. It's beautiful looking out at the, the springtime scene, but I'm happy to be in here talking to you guys. All right. I appreciate that. So like I said, folks, if you have questions, you want to drop those right in the chat. Um, those questions could come from students and teachers alike. That's not a problem. Um, if you want to say, you, you know, a quick little hey, or you want to shout out to your favorite teacher or anything like that, you know, put your teacher's name in there and say, hey, give it a teacher shout out. We'd be happy to do that too uh, if we catch it because sometimes the chat just, you know, cranks anyway. Um, so anyway, nonetheless here, Gina, let's actually start with our exam. We're going to follow our exam format for now. But like I said, folks, if you've got questions, just drop it right in there and we'll deal with it. Um, let's actually start with um, let's actually start with thinking about this exam. We know it's going to be digital tomorrow, but we're really focusing on um, exam strategies for just like getting through the content. Um, in fact, Marco Learning, which is actually linked in the description down below, is going to be running a digital exam multiple choice intensive moment after us. So at nine o'clock tonight, they're gonna to stream a live digital exam kind of, hey, how do you do the multiple choice and digital elements here? Uh, we will talk about a little bit today, but we're gonna focus a lot on uh, content um, instead of all the, hey, here's how you do things digitally because we're not sharing our screen or anything. But anyway, so Gina, let's actually start with our multiple choice exam. When your kids take the multiple choice, what are some of the best things that you tell kids to do? And also what are some of the best kids um, Sorry, the best things that you tell kids like, hey, you need to avoid this, by the way. Oh, shout out to Mrs. Leal, by the way. Hopefully I said that correctly. Uh, but all right, Gina, here we go. What do we do? What should we do on our multiple choice? What shouldn't we do? And then we'll talk about some other things. And if you have any, if you have any digital exam tips too, toss those in while we do it. Um, for multiple choice, I think like the two main things that I tell my students are process of elimination, which admittedly is a little trickier digitally because on paper we tend to we cross things out. Right. Um, but you still want to be going through everything, you know, with A, well, that's not right. Get A out, never look at it again. And then B, maybe right. C, no, that's not right either. So just keep track of that. Definitely go through process of, el of elimination. It's really elementary. And so students seem to think that you don't need to do that anymore. But I really think that's, if you just look at the odds game, you bring down a 20% chance of getting it right, hopefully down to a 50-50. That's classic. So, yeah, so just keep doing process of elimination. And then the other thing um, that you want to make sure you're doing, and this is for all portions of the exam is close reading. I have so many students who, when we go through a practice test or we go through a multiple choice, I say, okay, well, why did you put D? And they say, oh, I thought that it said this, but I see now that it says this. And right. so it's like 75% of the time, they're just not reading it closely. And it's because the time crunch is there and we're anxious and we're worried, but just reading, like taking a deep breath, reading it closely and pay attention to those adjectives. AP likes to throw a lot of adjectives in their answers. And so while simile might be right, if there's an adjective in the simile answer that's not right, 
that whole thing's wrong. Gone, uh, I tell my it. students half wrong, all wrong. That's like right. if any part of it is wrong, it's gone. It's wrong. Um, as for what you you shouldn't do, I would say don't get too hung up on the time, um, especially because you're going digital. I can see the the possibility of people really rushing through the first few answers. And then you find out that you still have 30 minutes and you're on the last passage. So keep that time in your mind for sure. But it, it doesn't need to go as quickly as you probably imagine. Yeah. So just take your time and make sure you're really committing to give everything your full focus. That'd be my short answer for multiple choice. <laughs> Awesome. Now, um, I want to just give a quick shout out. There was someone that posted in the comments. I think it actually said, ah, I, I think I lost it. That's no good. Uh, because someone's awesome. There it is. Yeah, Ms. Mooney. So shout out to Ms. Mooney there. Apparently your students think you're awesome. And I'm sure that you absolutely are. Uh, make sure you get in contact if you're listening to this, Ms. Mooney, with the Garden of English. I'd love to do a video with you uh, because I like to work with awesome teachers. That's how I actually got to know Gina a little bit because she was all over the place. And I was like, ah, she seems awesome. Let's actually try to get together here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, honestly, I think sometimes kids ignore the idea of the process of elimination more than they actually should. Um, I do see some comments coming through in the chat here that particularly talk about this idea of the, um, you know, the uh, pressure of the digital exam, like you can't go back, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how do you feel about that, the idea of like the not, not going back? Like, is there any way we can kind of transform the pressure of, oh, I can't go back into something that's, that's good? Like, have you thought about it in that way? I've always been the kind where I commit to an answer and then I need to move on. Um, because if I go back and second guess myself, usually I change a right answer to a wrong answer. That's mm -hmm. just me. So I do tend to, to think about it, put down an answer. Sometimes I'll circle it and go back to it. But most of the time I don't. Usually my gut instinct is the right instinct. Yeah. So while it seems scary, I don't think it's as scary as it as it seems initially, when you hear you can't go back. Um, I know that anxiety and test anxiety is so, so real. So just, again, take your time, take that deep breath, but then also commit to the answer and move on. There's 54 more of them or however many. Yeah. You know, it's not all going to lie in this one answer. Right. So don't let it overtake you when it comes to that anxiety or that pressure. You know, what's interesting is that most of the time in my classroom, when students are actually taking multiple choice with me, they typically change their answer to the wrong answer mm -hmm. as opposed to keeping it with their gut. And I, I can't tell you how many times they're like, oh, I had that. So I actually appreciate that, that element about not going back where it's like, you know what, know what you're doing and then commit to it and go forward. Yeah. And that helps us kind of just keep pushing forward. Um, please note, somebody actually asked about the idea, you know, I, I, I don't like that I can't annotate. And although you can't annotate um, – in the traditional sense, you can annotate. And so for anybody who has not actually downloaded, well, I think you've probably all downloaded the digital app, but if you haven't gone through the test element, like the, the practice of it yet, you wanna make sure that you can because the annotations are there. You highlight the text, you click the annotate button, and then it brings up, it'll let, it'll let you highlight, it'll let you underline, it'll let you type in little notes on your own. Now, one of the tips that I wanna actually suggest to you all uh, tonight is this, that you go into that system tonight and you open up your test again and that you click on that question mark up in the top right hand corner. And the reason why is because that's the help guide. And if you scroll down, you're gonna actually see the key, like keyboard codes. Like you know how when we typically do copy and paste and we do control C and control V and it makes things quick, right? Well, they have keyboard shortcuts for the AP exam that can bring up the annotation right away. So the annotation tool gets popped right up if you just know the keyboard shortcut. And then you could actually select your answers uh, by knowing the, the keyboard shortcut. So I, I use a Windows PC. So for me, it's Control Shift 1, that's answer A. Control Shift 2 is answer B, all the way up to 5, which gets me to answer E. So um, because of that, you could practice with those shortcuts. That made things so much easier for me and so much quicker. So I really want to encourage, I know that's not a multiple choice strategy per se, but it's a digital strategy that I think can really help people save time, um, that can really help people save time um, when they're going through because you don't have to keep moving your mouse back and forth. The other thing too is that if you don't have a mouse, like try to get one because if you can get a mouse, that's going to allow you to not have to be like moving your finger all around and whatnot. You can actually just move your mouse, click uh, um, and go. So make sure that you practice the demo and whatnot. Um, the now, question, is it worth it to do the practice exam too on the online one? Uh, you know, uh, you know, tonight is the night before the exam. You still have a little bit of time. I, I would do so and I think that, you know, the, in, in the United States, those exams actually, you know, start relatively, you know, I think in the East Coast, um, I don't remember the time that it starts, you'll have to forgive me, I didn't check that part, but 
Um, what happens is, um, I think that it's going to be around like noonish when it starts on the East Coast, something around there. So even if you're on the West Coast and it's starting at like 8 or 9, make sure you check your schedule there, folks, okay? Uh, you can wake up an hour early. Take that 15-minute exam just to practice with the... Uh, to practice with the interface and mm -hmm. thinking about those types of questions. It's a good warm-up, you know? Um, and so I would, I would totally encourage it, and I would probably do it tonight. Shout-out to Mrs. Barber, by the way. I just saw that show up in the comment. If you ever see anything, shout, you know, throw that shout-out in there, too. Um, I'm going to actually give a couple more tips for multiple choice here. Now, Gina, i got to tell you, I love the idea of, you know, commit to it, go forward, the process of elimination. I want to talk just a minute about lead distractors uh, because I actually had a kid who took the paper exam um, who, who contacted me just last week and was like, you know, I really thought about your, your advice on lead distractors, and it really helped me deal with what was going on in my AP Wood exam. So I'm going to tell you all right now um, what you want to think about for lead distractors. There are three common things that I have seen anecdotally, right? So, Gina, correct me if I'm wrong here, if you have any other tips too. But anecdotally, I've noticed that lead distractors typically do three things. The first thing that they do is what Gina already mentioned, and you want to look out for this, Right? If you have something wrong, the whole answer is wrong. So that means that the, the answer has some truth in it, but it's not all true. And because of that, we got to toss out the whole thing. That's the classic lead distractor. And typically, you know, if we put one of those adjectives there that students might not always know, like, um, you know, colloquial um, or didactic or something like that, um, students are like, mm, that word sounds big. It's going to be the right answer. If exactly. Put, yeah, yeah. Right. All those shiny adjectives. Yeah. And, and, and they're distracting. They're, they, they twinkle, but we want to try to say, no, 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 that might not be it. So the first thing about lead distractors, the first type you're going to get is it's only half true. So mm -hmm. it has some correct information, some incorrect information, and you think about that. So if you can get rid of that, hey, that's not true. Get rid of that. We're good to go. Be very wary of answers that have language in it that you don't know typically the big vocab is not actually the correct answer. Sometimes it is, but on the whole, Gina, I mean, have you had that same experience where it's typically, it's not the shiny vocab that actually is the correct answer? I do find a lot of times people, they eliminate an answer because it seems too simple and it was the right answer. So yeah, you don't need to fall for a word just because it used a vocab word that you weren't familiar with it. It doesn't make it right. Yeah. And a lot of times the simplest answer can still be the right answer. Absolutely. Now, I am seeing some, some comments come up in here that are talking about commentary and sophistication. When we actually move to talking about the essays, we will totally talk about those things. So don't get the wrong idea. Uh, and we'll go through the essays in order, poetry and prose, and then question three. Okay. Um, and so just please note such things. Uh, but right now we're still talking a little bit about multiple choice. So the other thing that I do with multiple choice for lead distractors is not only the half, the half correct, half incorrect, there's also the type of answer that is actually entirely correct, but it's not correct for that particular question stem. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure you know what the stem is actually asking, and you need to apply your answers to that question stem. Because sometimes you're like, I actually remember reading that. Well, when you remember mm -hmm. reading that correct answer, but it doesn't tie to what it's looking for, let's say um, it's a question about setting and mood, let's say, and the answer is uh, in a particular set of lines and there's a certain mood at the end of the passage that is an entirely different section and you're like oh i remember that mood being in there that's not the right answer for that particular question stem because they want to know about the setting and mood from the beginning not the end so you got to make sure sometimes that the lead distractor is actually a fully correct answer but not for that particular stem so that's the second thing you want to look for and the third thing that you want to look for um is you want to look for the more concrete answer because sometimes they'll have something that's abstract and the better answer is a more concrete version of it. Um, let me think of an example here. Um, I might have a question about like the overall, uh, you know, theme of a piece and it might say, you know, that, you know, social, um, social interaction, right? However, the correct answer might actually be something along the lines of like familial bonding. Now, familial bonding is a type of social interaction, but it's a much more specific social interaction. And if the piece is about family, you're good to go. Um, do you have any, did I miss any lead distractors that you're typically used to, Gina? 
No, I think those are the ones that I see the most. And then there was a question in the chat about, is there, um, I call it the guessing penalty. Like, do you lose points for having an incorrect answer? And that's a really good question. And no, it's just earned points for right answers. So you should always answer every multiple choice question. Absolutely. And no, on digitally, if you can, I'm assuming you can leave one blank, but you shouldn't. You should always guess to, you got a 20% shot of getting it right even if you don't read the question so you should always put an answer right and actually when you when, when you answer um you know sometimes people like spot check their guesses and mm -hmm. they're like oh i'm gonna put a b i haven't put a d in a while and whatever statistically speaking if you actually pick one letter and bring it through you have a better chance of getting more correct so just so everybody knows if you're at the point where you have to be guessing then please note such things <laughs> um, oh there's one other thing about multiple choice i totally forgot to mention and this works with AP Lit better than anything else. And I promise you all, if you go look at um, any practice AP Lit poem that you can get your hands on right now for multiple choice, if you can find the correct, like, let's say you just do a Google search, past AP Lit, multiple choice, you pull it up and you, and you have the poetry passage with the questions next to it. And this is particularly true for poetry, but it does work for both. Go to the right answers and circle the right answers. Don't read the question stems. And if you read the right answers... Before you even read the poem, you should be able to figure out what the poem is about in its entirety. The coolest thing about AP Lit is that the correct answers in multiple choice always relate, unless they're looking for a lit, certain lit element, they always relate to the thematic ideas of the piece. So if you can narrow it down to two answers and only one of those answers has the thematic idea in it, you can know with a lot of confidence which one is the correct answer. So what I mean by that is let's say I'm reading a piece and it's about you know, um, conflict in families. So I've got two ideas there, conflict and family. And I get to a passage and I get to my, my multiple choice answer and only one of them deals with conflict or family, boom, that's most likely your right answer because the universal idea shows up in almost every right answer for multiple choice. And when I actually teach this in my classroom at the beginning of the year, I give the kids a poem and I say, don't read the poem. I give them all the right answers on the multiple choice and then I have them read the answers and I'm like, hey, what's the poem about? And they could tell me, and then we'll go and read the poem, and they're like, oh, my word, I feel like we already knew that. I'm like, yeah, because all the multiple choice answers relate thematically, because that's what AP Lit is. Every choice mm -hmm. a speaker makes is conveying some sort of a thematic message uh, or exploring some sort of thematic idea. So uh, I forgot to mention that. Um, uh, other questions about multiple choice in here before we actually move on. You talked about that. What would you say is a good time to spend per passage? There yeah. was a question about... Um, how thorough should our reading be when there's a time limit? Yeah, I mean, you think about what you've practiced in class already this year because most of you are have practiced in class. And also with AP Lit, it's so important to read the whole passage before you get into the mm -hmm. questions. Like, oh my word, folks, promise me you'll read the whole passage first. Because with, with literature, a lot of times the message comes out at the very end. It's those last two mm -hmm. lines of the poem that really kick you, you know? Um, but I would suggest that you're looking to spend, if you've got five passages on the exam, um, you're looking to spend, you know, 10 to 12 minutes per passage and questions that, that go with it. But it's very hard to put time limits on things because we don't know how many questions are going to be tied to a particular reading. And so because of that, you, don't, you know, I, I don't want you to be like, oh, eight minutes are up. Let's just guess and then move on. You know, take the test. You guys will be fine. I know it's a new... Uh, it's a new venture to do this online, but you have skills. You've been preparing the, for this all year, and it's a new opportunity where we can adapt because we're human. That's what we do. We adapt, right? We get to be fully human on our AP Lit exam. How cool is that, right? Because that's what AP Lit is about. What is humanity like, right? So let's, let's engage with that. Um, and I would suggest, though, you're looking at about 10 to 12 minutes per passage, and you're going to be in decent shape for sure. Mm -hmm. And also they might vary depending on what kind of poem you have. Like my students tend to go slower on a sonnet or anything that has meter and they're scared because it's old. And then they tend to cruise faster on the free verse and the modern poems. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you might be the complete opposite way. So yeah. don't feel again, like you're stuck with, oh, 10 minutes went up, I have to go to the next one. No, if, if this one's 14 minutes, the next one might only be eight. So right. again, don't get too obsessed with the time factor. Yeah. And the timer is going to be right up in the top there, and you'll have your hour once you start, and just take a breath and go do, right? Because you can, and I, I'm pretty sure you all will indeed be successful. But anyway, so, you know, to wrap up our multiple choice conversation, if anybody else has any multiple choice questions, toss them in there, okay? Um, 
you know, toss them in there and we'll, we'll come back to them. Um, any tips on distraction? Okay. <laughs> Oh, uh, we'll talk about distractions and sidetrack. We'll, do, we'll deal with writing stuff in just a few minutes. But uh, for multiple choice, once again, know the types of lead distractors. Anecdotally, we covered three different types of those lead distractors. Know that, um, you know, don't, don't neglect those test-taking strategies you already know. Think about the idea that in AP Lit, if you can identify the thematic ideas and the thematic message, that should be able to help you narrow down your answers for your multiple choice as well. Um, and also, relax. Don't be scared. Be human. You guys, you guys will be, you guys will be okay. All right. So what? We take our multiple choice. We submit our answers. So we're clicking through. We're submitting our answers. Oh, by the way, folks, don't forget. Go learn your key codes tonight because those key commands those will make things quicker. Um, so Gina, we learn all this stuff and then we move on to question one because with AP Wit they didn't change the order of the questions. We've got poetry, we've got prose, we've got question three. Now, Gina, are we allowed to change that order tomorrow? I don't think we are. Mm -mm, no, we're not. Are we allowed to go back once we submit? I don't think we are either. No, mm -mm, we are not. So, at least that you have my sympathies. I know that that's frustrating. Yeah, it can be. You know, because uh, for me, I'm the type of guy that likes to do the stuff I can do super easily first, so I can have more time for the hard. But yep. um, my dog oh, is singing to me, so in case you hear any kind of weird noises, it's just my dog. Who's... I can't. I can't even hear a dog. So we're okay, in great good. shape. <laughs> Um, one question that did come up here is this, and this is a multiple choice question, so we'll kind of go back to this before we talk about poetry, Gina. But it says, when do you know when to move on to the next question when you're just stuck? Like, what would be your general rule of thumb there? I would ask myself if I've spent more than two minutes on this one single question. And if I have, then I just be like, I need to commit and move on. Because if anything, it's just, again, the math factor of the time running out. Right. Nothing's worth it two minutes of me staring at the same question. Right. And, you know, and, you know, thinking about it and then make your best guess. You know, I, I was about to say two minutes as well. So I, you know, that's, that's, that's good shape. And most of the time it, it shouldn't take you two minutes to get through that one. No. question. Uh, but if you, if you hit about two minutes, you got to be like, all right, I need to, I need to move on. That's for sure. Uh, somebody mm -hmm. asked if they could take the, uh, you know, go to the key codes again, if uh, they've already taken the practice test, I, I was able to reaccess it. I, so I think that you should be able to, if you could go through there. Um, so, Jaden, I would type out the key codes. The problem is, is that I have, I have them as pictures, like just on my phone right here, and I, I, I can't, like, you know, I'm not sure I can get those up there. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and they're also super small, so I can't type in the key codes. I'm super sorry, but I do remember that on on my PC. That control shift one, control shift two, control shift three, and control shift four and five were my answer, my my quick answer key controls. And so if I just kept my, if I keep my cursor on the next button, I hit control shift one for A, click my next, and then I'll move on to my next question. Um, and so please note such things. But all right, so let's say we finish our multiple choice, Gina. I need to know what should I do for poetry? What should I avoid for poetry when I'm writing my essay? What are some of the best tips you can give us? And if you and I give different tips, it's okay because we're different teachers and we're just trying to give kids all that we can. I think with poetry, I don't really approach the three different questions that differently because they're all asking you to make it, essentially they're asking you to make an interpretation. And it's yes. the same writing strategies throughout each one. So one, you don't need to get too hung up over, oh gosh, it's poetry. But I think the reason there's so much anxiety with the poetry question is because we've been taught to approach poems like they're a riddle and you have to unearth their very secret answer. And yeah. only the very smartest people know their secret answer. Yeah. And that's not at all what it's meant to be. Um, you're just supposed to read this poem, use the text, find the evidence, make a claim, make sure you're reading that, that prompt very carefully so that you don't fall down the wrong path and write the wrong kind of essay. Make sure you're responding to the prompt, but it's really not any more complicated than that. They want to know that you can make an interpretation based on the text of the poem and can you back it up like a sophisticated writer? Yeah. And they want you to do that with the prose and they want you to do that with the open exam too. So with poetry, I just think the biggest problem we have is that we make it seem scary. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be scary. We don't have to go in defeated. And I think that a lot of times we do. We just go in with that kind of defeated look um, or approach. And because of that, that makes it even harder, right? Instead of saying, mm -hmm. I've had, I, I can read, I have skills, I've been practicing, we kind of are like, it's poetry, that's hard. I'm just going to mm -hmm. do poorly on that one and, and you know, whatever. Right. Um, now, one of the things that could actually make the reading poetry easier, and I'm going to just throw a tip in here super quick, is with the poetry prompt, and you can actually do this with all three of the prompts, so you'll hear me mention this again, 
but you can always turn the end of a poetry prompt into a question. So a few years ago, they had a prompt that um, was for a poem called For That He Looked Not Upon Her. Mm-hmm. And the prompt said, you know, how does the author or the poet use literary techniques in order to convey the complex attitude of the speaker toward the woman or something like that, mm-hmm. right? And if I get to the very end, somebody asked a question, how do you not get sidetracked or distracted while you're writing? And I have another question here that said something along the lines of how do you pull out a thesis when you might not understand the passage? Mm-hmm. Well, if you go to that, if you go to that prompt and you actually turn it into a question and I say, okay, at the very end, it says analyze the literary strategies that, uh, that the author uses to convey the complex attitude of the speaker towards this woman. My question is that I have to answer, what is the speaker's attitude and why is it complex? Or what is the speaker's complex attitude? So if I create that question from my prompt, and every prompt allows you to do this, folks, mm-hmm. every single one, I now have to just read, where do I see the speaker's attitude throughout the whole piece? And when I see that he's longing to look at her but doesn't want to because he's fearful of being hurt, the moment I see that he's longing but doesn't want to, I've got two layers of complexity there. I can write the paper, no problem. Right. Then- complexity just means there's more than one thing happening. So when you have attraction with also disgust, that's complexity. It doesn't need to be harder than that. Yeah. Right. And you know what? Um, and, you know, Casey actually, and I'm sorry if it's Cassie, but I think it's Casey, right? Uh, Casey brought up a question here in the chat that says, you know, probably hard to answer but what happens like when your question two or your question one has has uh you know early modern english in it like what do you tell your kids to do on test day when that happens i i have a tip but um i want to hear what you what you say first the only thing i would say if if it's really out of your vocabulary there will be a footnote that explains it so everything that you really do need to know they'll make sure that you have explained to you um I think that because if it's if it's written in meter, then it can be kind of tricky because they're not speaking straightforwardly. But again, just don't make it overly complicated. Go back to the basic prompt. What's the attitude? What's the relationship? Um, what, you you go ahead and give your tip because I'm about to talk about different poems and I don't uh, want to get carried. No, that, that's perfect, right? So my tip for this is this, right? When my kids get um, archaic prose, I tell them to hashtag it. I'm like, read four lines and throw down a, a Twitter hashtag because you got to get this poem into Twitter, right? And mm-hmm. the, reason, the reason why this works, folks, is this. I want you to go to an Instagram when we're done this kind of session, and I want you to look at all the hashtags that are under the picture without the caption, and I want you to try to tell me what your friend was doing in that picture. And you're going to be like, oh, that kid was blah, 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 blah. So when I do this in my classroom, I bring, I bring up a picture of my wife and me. We went, to, we went to go see a comedian named John Christ one night in Boston, right? And it has everything that, like, you know, all of the hashtags and whatnot that are down there. And I, t- I asked my kids, I'm like, what did we do that night? And they can narrate my whole night from reading the hashtags. And I'm like, so you're telling me that if I give you disparate minor ideas with hashtags, you can actually create a full narrative for me. But when I give you actual sentences with purposeful punctuation, you can't understand that? Mm-hmm. I don't understand how that works. So now they think about, oh, can I just hashtag ideas and try to even simplify the poem even more? And that helps with comprehension like you can't imagine. Um, and I owe that to Crystal Little Liberty. She's a friend of mine um, who's also done some work for the Garden of English. And she, she got me doing that with my students a couple years ago. And I've seen immense success from that. That's a great idea. I just wrote that down actually for myself. Hopefully I remember it by August. <laughs> right? If not, just give me a call and you'll be like, remember when you said something, yeah. you know, ridiculous? Something that was yeah. smart that right. time. Yeah. All right. So anyway, talk about your poems here and then we'll continue with, uh, you know, talking about thesis statements and writing things and, and whatnot. Yeah. I think that a few, I'm thinking back on a few of the poems that we've had over the last couple of years. Uh, the Landlady comes to mind and Plants by Olive Senior, if you remember either one of those from maybe a practice exam. And what I saw happening is, again, this this approach like it's a riddle in the interpretation that the landlady is nosy because she's lonely. But then someone started the rumor that the landlady was a cat. And then everyone lost their minds because they misread it because the landlady's really a cat. There was nothing that ever told you the landlady was a cat. I still don't believe the landlady is a cat. But if the landlady is nosy, because she's lonely and she interrupts your your personal space 
because she has no personal relationships, that's enough to build a complex argument on. Right. And now you have to just start your method, stay true with what proper analytical writing is, throw that sophistication in there as much as you're able to. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't need to be overly complicated than that. Not everything needs to be a unique no one's ever thought of this idea because right. there's 14, how many, there's 3000 people taking this essay, this exam, you oh, know? There's, no, there's way more than that. I don't even know um, the number anymore. No, oh my gosh. So there, so the AP Lang, um, I think AP lit is typically up around two to 300,000. Um, no, because, no. Uh, for sure. Oh, wait, yeah, because yeah. AP Lang, AP yeah, Lang what was is I about 600,000. I think I was going through the number of essays I have to that's score. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or, or the readers. So that's so why I was so low. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah you're not going to be, you're, you're all so, so smart and intelligent and creative, but you maybe won't come up with a, with an analysis that's so perfectly unique to just you. That's okay. It, it can still be. And it can, it doesn't have to be like, you're not playing it safe. Just look for that strong complexity. And again, back it up with really great analysis. And you can still write a very solid essay that way. You don't need to worry about, did I interpret it right? Oh my gosh, what if it was something so special and I didn't catch it? Well, and if it was, then who cares? It's not that big a deal. Right. Now, a couple of things about poetry too. I tell my kids to write through the poem. So I always say, you need to do this. Um, and just so you all know, everybody that's paying attention, I have videos on my YouTube channel, um, actually some that I even did with Gina about, about analyzing poetry. Um, and I actually have a thesis template for you all. I have topic sentence templates for you all, uh, body paragraphing templates, and conclusion templates. And I actually have topic sentence stems for you all where, you, where it's like, here's what your stem should look like. But I, for poetry in particular, although this is true for all literature, um, I make sure my students, I tell them, you have to write through the poem. So you say, okay, if I take the first chunk of it, and at, like at the top, I say, okay, the author begins by doing this. So notice my language there, begins by doing this, and then we have in order to, and I say, what's the first observation of interpretation that you get? So if, what, if, the, if the question we're answering is, you know, the complex conflict um, that, that's between the characters, okay, the author begins by doing this in the poem in order to highlight that the conflict centers around blah, blah, blah. And then they put the text in and they show that it highlights the conflicts around blah, blah, blah. They move to topic sentence number two. The poet then shifts to, they put in what the, what the poet shifts to, shifts to describing this going on, in order to highlight that the conflict now has become such and such. And then the thing about poetry, and Gina, tell me if you think I'm wrong about this, but with poetry, if you're going to provide a detailed complex analysis, you have to have the last three or four lines quoted, well, not all of them, but you need to have a quote from the last three or four lines in your last paragraph because that's where the theme comes in. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that, Gina? It's just important to show that you've read through the whole thing and also that you've understand, you understand the whole thing. Um, if you do get an essay, no matter how well written it is, and they're only talking about the first half of the poem, it just really doesn't make sense. The analysis will feel incomplete. And like you said, you probably haven't touched on the whole theme. And so that's why it's gonna feel it's gonna feel incomplete. So you gotta make sure to kind of be moving through it in that logical way. Right. And I also tell my kids, like if you're only gonna write a thesis in two body paragraphs, you gotta pull from that beginning in that end to kind of build this complexity here. Um, just real quick, I don't know what you tell your kids, but for my students, and my students do score fine on the AP exam every year, the AP lit and lang exam. But I tell my students now, I'm an AP Lang reader. You've been an AP Lit reader. Mm -hmm. um, but for my kids, I tell them, just your thesis for your intro paragraph. There's no reason to spice up this intro. Get your thesis as a single sentence intro paragraph that says, here's where I'm going, and then get right into your evidence and commentary because that's where your points are going to go. Uh, how do you feel about that, Gina? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I usually tell mine to do two or three sentences just because – um, some of them have a hard time moving in getting both a claim and that whole line of reasoning done in just one sentence. But I do have to remind them all the time. This isn't like a normal essay. You're under time constraints and yeah. we know that. So short at short intro. And honestly, I think even more important than conclusion a sentence like two, if you need to, you don't need to have that long windy conclusion because you've probably already made your point by the time you got to the end of that last body paragraph, hopefully. And so that conclusion is just the cursory wrap up, you know, hammer home that line of reasoning. In my, in my conclusion videos for poetry and my AP wit stuff on the garden of English, um, 
I actually talk about how the, your conclusion paragraph is actually kind of your final body paragraph if you're going to do it right. Otherwise, like honestly, if you're just restating your thesis for your conclusion, right. don't even don't even put it on there. That's really what most of them do. And then that's when you want it to be super short. If you're going to save your conclusion to when you really like tie the bow on your argument, then yeah, you better make sure you're really you're really talking through that thing. Now, I'm going to answer I'm going to try to take out a couple questions here from the chat about this as well for commentary and whatnot. But before I do, um, one of them says, you know, if you put the theme in the thesis, do you have to defend that theme throughout the whole essay? Now, for me, with my students, what I make them do is I make them put a theme in the thesis. But if the essay says, analyze the speaker's complex attitude towards his lover, the essay has to actually analyze the speaker's attitude towards the lover. So for me, when my kids put the theme in the thesis, they'll say, all right, so the author does A, B, and C to convey this about the attitude of the lover and they'll and they won't say complex do not say complex attitude folks you have to list it out you need yeah. to say in order to highlight that the lover is both apprehensive and hurt right when considering his past you know relationship ultimately illustrating that and that last ultimately illustrating is theme for my kids that's where they put their thematic statement now my kids write the whole paper to talk about how the speaker is um, apprehensive and hurt but still intrigued in a relationship and then their discussion of theme comes out in the very last paragraph for me i don't have them incorporate it throughout i have them focus on what the prompt makes them focus on but theme comes up at the end because i think that that's how we sophisticatedly wrap it up because it's universal but what about you i think that it's important to remember the line of reasoning i usually tell my students that they're kind of making two arguments they're responding to the prompt but they also need to have this thing that they're going to weave through the whole way the whole way from the beginning to the end of the essay. So if I'm going to argue that uh, the lover is feeling complexity because he's been burned by the girl in the past, yeah. my my claims are going to be how he feels like he loves her, but how he also feels like he's been hurt. And here's my evidence. But my line of reasoning is going to be that it leaves him in a state of being stuck and he does nothing. Um, that's not very good. But some, right. something like that. I need to make a claim that's that's kind of connected to what I'm going to talk about, but also is a separate argument so that I can keep returning to that in every paragraph. And that kind of also helps answer another question. Can I earn full credit with just one body paragraph? I don't think you really can because you need to show that growth um, and that transition throughout your argument in developing your essay. I think you can, I mean, if you're short on time, you can still score a three. Um, maybe a four if you're amazing with just one body paragraph yeah, um but I really if, you, if it's your first essay if it's your poetry essay i would assume that you're probably going to want to have more than one body and, paragraph well, not only that but the the criteria for the four as opposed to the three is it explains mm -hmm. how multiple literary elements yeah. contribute to the meaning of the poem so that to me typically i have my kids deal with each literary element separately in each body paragraph so because of that i think that you're gonna you know shoot for thesis and two body paragraphs minimum now somebody just asked a question so we don't have to write an intro about blank if the passage is about that like some sort of random intro in my classroom never all timed writings just your thesis as your intro and like i said i've been teaching it this way for years because i know that in laying it works as well and my kids do fine every year on the ap wood exam um, i actually have templates for my kids answers that they fill in and they do just fine uh, mm -hmm. because it really focuses on the reading here um and um, so that's kind of how that works. Now, someone did ask, though, can we use two literary literary elements or literary devices instead of three? I think the answer is yes. I just think you're going to have a more comprehensive paper if you take a little bit from the beginning, little from the middle, little from the end. You know, I also think that you don't want to confuse literary elements with textual evidence. Those right. are very, very different. Um, a lot of the really formulaic essays that I see, they do okay, but they don't score in the top, top, top range is because they organize their essay by literary device. This poem is magical because it has a simile, it has personification, and it has imagery. And the problem with organizing like that is it breaks up the line of reasoning. Um, and it just doesn't read with that sophistication point in mind. Something that I tell my students is to stick with the argument and then use literary elements. I, I tell them to sprinkle. 
um, like it's a donut and you ordered sprinkles on top of it. So if you're going to be talking about this complex argument and you're like, wow, that's actually kind of ironic irony, throw that in there. So you don't need to make sure that every paragraph hangs completely on one poetic element, sprinkle them in there and do it naturally. We appreciate it more when those literary elements are applied naturally than when you force it. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely true. Right. And so, uh, a couple of things I've got, to, we're getting some other questions in here about how to kind of organize this type of stuff, right? Um, one of the things is this, right? I have my students list their devices, sorry, not even just devices, because devices are like simile, metaphor, all those lit terms that you know. I don't make my kids use those terms. I have my kids say, a literary element is anything a, uh, uh, an author uses to convey the meaning that mm -hmm. relates to some sort of part of the literature. So like if my kids want to talk about plot and they see a conflict, they might say the author presents Billy Joe and Sally Jane arguing. And I'm like, boom, that's a literary element because that relates to plot and that's a conflict. Now, they don't have to say conflict, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the, one of the questions over here is, should I write through my piece chronologically? I say absolutely yes. And the reason why is because that's how you could trace the complexity that you're trying to get to in your understanding of the poem or prose passage you say the author begins by doing this in order to convey this the author then shifts to doing this which either furthers what you said in the paragraph before or contrasts or adds to or complements and then we have the author then finishes by and if they write chronologically in my classroom at least i've noticed that my kids can produce a much more sophisticated comprehensive understanding of the piece and i think that that's the best way to do it mm -hmm. Just long, just make sure you're not summarizing the entire poem, that you're still keeping that argument in mind so you avoid the plot summary. It's all about going back to those basics. What's your interpretation? What was your claim? That kind of thing. And actually, that um, helped. That help, one of those things is, like, think about topic sentences here. For mm -hmm. my students, what they have to do is they will provide an element of summary in their topic sentence, but they have to connect it to a why. So let me give you an example. All of my students, every time they write a topic sentence, have to have a what and a why. So what are they going to talk about from the from the from the prose or the poem and why. So they will actually say, let's say we're talking about that poem for that he looked not upon her. Um, and um, they get to the middle and they're like, okay, the speaker then shifts to um, discussing a mouse in a trap in order to highlight how apprehensive he is to engage with this woman or with his lover. Well, the mouse trap is the evidence that they're gonna put in their paragraph and they're gonna weave that quote in next and then they're going to say, here's how this shows, this language in this quote shows his apprehension. So the topic sentence always has a what and a why. But mm -hmm. notice I said the speaker compares, or the speaker brings up a mousetrap. Or I could say the speaker compares himself to a common household vermin. I'm mm -hmm. not saying simile. I'm, you know, I'm saying compares himself to, but we're still talking about similes. So we're still mm -hmm. talking about literary elements. So you can put that kind of summary moment there, but you have to add a why in that topic sentence. Otherwise, it's going to be like, oh, this is a summary. No doubt yeah. about it. I tell my students that all of their body paragraphs should be APE. That's something we work on all year. It's assert, prove, explain. Yes. Even if that's formulaic, that still helps them score high enough in that middle section for evidence and commentary, even if the writing's not spicy or anything. Assert is your claim. Prove is your evidence. Explain is where you explain why it's important, and you bring in that line of reasoning. If you're doing that consistently, you're going to score high in that middle section. Right. And I want to just point to a lot of people in the comments, right? Just please remember that I do have videos for every type of essay for AP Lit and they're in playlist modes where I have how do you write a thesis for AP Lit? Actually, how do you break down the prompt? How do you write a thesis? How do you write strong body paragraphs? How do you write strong conclusions for all three types of essays? So if you're like, I got to cram again tonight, well, I don't encourage you to not get sleep, but by all means, feel free to watch those videos as well that break down each section for you. Now, one other question that I've seen coming up here a little bit, um, oh, it's one of them that we've already answered, but that's okay. Um, you cannot choose the order of your essays on the digital exam. You have to write it and then you have to go. Um, so just please know such things. Um, and that's one of the things that's a little bit unfortunate, but it is what it is. Uh, we can't change that. Um, but one of the questions was about commentary. <clears throat> um, actually, I want to talk about this one that says how many sentences should we have in each paragraph that just popped up. Uh, a paragraph is done when you've completed what the topic sentence says. So in my classroom, when the kids say, he compares himself to a common household vermin in order to highlight his apprehension and desire for his lover. Once they put the text in that shows the mouse in the trap there, right, and how he doesn't want to go back, but he might, 
and then they provide their commentary, however long that takes, that's when that's how long that paragraph has to be. No sentence number. Yeah. Um, now, some will be very long and some will not be. It depends on what, what claim you've made. Right, especially like when my kids analyze punctuation, like in gym or things like that, a lot of times the, the, that paragraph will be four sentences and it, it can actually be done pretty well. Or just even the, the title of something. They'll be like, yeah. by, by, you know, like by titling the poem Mending Wall, you know, um, um, Frost highlights the irony and then they just explain why it's ironic and then they move on. And that's like a four sentence paragraph. Uh, I don't encourage that. I encourage kids to write the beefy ones on exam day, but it is what it is. Um, um, something I would recommend, I see some people who are worried about the commentary and I, I think that a lot of the problems we also run into is that we start, we start typing our essay without really knowing where we're going to go with it. I tried something about a month ago with my students. I gave them a timed writing. I gave them the prompt, but I wouldn't let them have any paper. And I gave them five minutes with only the poem and only the prompt. And I would not let them have any scratch paper or any of their notebook paper yet. And then I gave them 40 minutes to write their essay. And everyone bumped up their scores because they were forced to brainstorm. Um, and they, they just couldn't start writing their topic sentences or starting on their introduction. It, it forced them to stop. And a few of them said, you know, I, I probably would have gone down a different path, except for in minute four, brainstorming, I saw something and I changed my whole argument. So... It could sometimes be worth it to sit back and make sure you've, you've structured out your whole essay ideas just to make sure you have that commentary. Again, going back to that line of reasoning, you're going to weave throughout the entire essay because if you start going and you get stuck and now, oh, I've already been doing this and it's an hour and I'm still in the first essay, then we can find ourselves not very organized and that can hurt us with that line of reasoning and with scoring high in evidence and commentary. Right, and especially because on the AP Wood exam, there's only two hours. It's not two hours and 15 minutes. Right. So, uh, we have to remember that. Now, one other thing about commentary here is this. For any of you that struggle with commentary, um, once again, first of all, I encourage you to try to turn the prompt into a question. If you want videos about how to do that, just check out the Garden of English page. By the way, folks, please make sure that you like and subscribe uh, to the Garden of English there. Subscribe to us. That's the easiest way for you to help us. Um, and also... Um, you know, Gina, I know that you run APLitAndMore.com, which is more for teachers, right? But it's nice to it's nice to at least go check it out because that's a great way to support Yeah, I course. have some skill spotlight lessons there. So if you're like, I just don't get personification, you could go and check those out. Right. And I think that that personification lesson actually deals with Inside Out, right? Um, and I was super amped about that. I tie, them, I tie most of them to movies. So yeah, they can and that makes it even more fun. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing, too, about commentary is this, though, folks. If you have been struggling with your commentary all year, the first thing that you want to do is you do want to make sure you get the question from the prompt where it's like, okay, what is the speaker's complex attitude? You need to say that, and then you need to say, what are those layers? Um, but when you write your commentary, you have your topic sentence, you put your evidence in your paragraph. When you start to explain how your evidence conveys some meaning here, use the word because. The word because will hook you up like you can't imagine. All year you've been told you need to add more commentary. Well, look, go back and look at your sentences. I'm willing to bet that you're like, and this, you know, um, the fact that the guy was comparing him to a mouse conveys that he's apprehensive, period. You're just stating a claim there. You need to put the word because right there. And if you put the word because there, now we're talking. Because that's going to force you to actually articulate, okay, that's going to force you to articulate um, what your reasoning is. Like, let me, you know what, Gina? I'm going to put you right on the spot, and this is going to be awesome, right? So I've got my nice Red Sox hat here. What color is that B right here? It's red. How do you know? Uh, I can see the red thread that makes up most of the letter. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you could see it, but you didn't tell me how it's actually red. How does it register to red, as red in your mind? Uh, I guess, like, do you want me to explain the biology of how my eyes work? <laughs> well, we, before we do explain the biology, though, we got to explain the color theory. Right. So I'm not following you. <laughs> so here's the deal, right? I, you know, when I said, when I said, what color is the B here? You're like, it's red. It's super easy. It's a what question, yeah. right? Turn your, turn your prompt into a what question. But now I'm like, well, how do you know? The first word you said was because. So I'm actually getting you to provide commentary and the word because is where it's at. So we want to yeah. do that, right? But the reason why this is red, if we, if we know color theory, is because we work on a white light spectrum, and that has red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. 
the rays are absorbed here, except for red, which is reflected. It goes through our eyes, through our retina, and registers as red with us because we speak English. That's how, that's how this is read. When we provide our commentary folks in our essays, right, what we're doing is we need to use that word because, because, Gina, let's admit it. This was very obviously read to you, right? Yeah. And you're like, it's just obvious, Tim. Like, yeah. shut up and leave me alone. Well, guess what? That's how you want to respond in your essays, folks, but that doesn't cut it. We need to see that reasoning broken down. So you need to say, how is that read? How is this complex for this person? And using the word because will really dig that out to you. So I'm sorry for putting you on the spot there, Gina. I knew it was going to happen that way. I was like, um, wow, it's really flattering that you thought I could explain that. <laughs> like, I actually knew I actually knew that that wouldn't be the first thing that popped into your mind. And so that's yeah. why I did it. And that's why you know, okay. I do that all the time with my students as well. Um, so somebody asked... Um, how, what if I struggle with coming up with the theme? Now, just so you all know, I know we've been talking about poetry for quite a bit now, but I would like to point out that all of what we're talking about for poetry works for all three of the questions. Let's be real. Yeah. You have a thesis. You've got two to three body paragraphs and a conclusion. You're fine. Your body paragraph should have a topic sentence, some evidence, and some commentary. But what happens? Do you have a trick about how to you know, kind of pick up theme if someone struggles with that? Someone said, could I, could I continue writing on my essay and suggest working backwards with connecting it all later? I actually think that's a really good idea mm -hmm. because I think as we're making an argument and we do dig deeper into the poem, you start to go like, ah, ah, and maybe you'll get a light bulb, but you've already been writing your essay for 25 minutes. It's why I suggest brainstorming at the beginning, but you don't want to spend 25 minutes writing an outline either. So I do think that working backwards can work um it the bottom line make sure that you're making an interpretation you're not just regurgitating the prompt if you say the speaker has a complex argument look at his complex argument thus complexity you actually don't even have a thesis there right. because the prompt told you that they were complex so make sure that you're still making that argument and like what you said about the commentary mine is the who cares factor like if any point you're reading through your essay and you just go well who cares then you haven't done enough with that commentary you have haven't tied it into theme okay bring it to something universal we can all understand what it's like to be burned by somebody and you yeah. still have that physical attraction but you kind of hate him at the same time that's, right. that's what you want to start talking about that's your universal feelings now you can start talking about theme um that might not hit you in the first four or five minutes of the poem that might hit you 15 minutes later but luckily you're still drafting through your essay so i think going backwards and adding that as long as you read through it before you submit and you don't let the time run away from you i think that's an okay strategy to have absolutely one of the things that i tell my kids to do to find theme is this as they read their poem when they see an idea that shows up through what's being discussed in the poem let's say they read the first part of the poem and it's loneliness mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they have the next part of the poem and they see not loneliness this time but abandonment Mm -hmm. And then they get to the end of it and they see longing. I'm like, well, there's your there's your topic sentences. The author does this to convey that the speaker is lonely. The author does this to convey that the speaker feels abandoned. The author does this to convey that the speaker longs for something more. But they have those three ideas, and I'm like, good. Now, put those three ideas into a sentence based on the relationship of this poem. And now we have this poem illustrates that feelings of loneliness and abandonment move people to long for companionship even more boom so but all they're doing is they're reading and they're like oh that's that relates to loneliness that relates to abandonment that relates to longing and then at the very end i'm like good turn that into a statement the author is conveying this message about those three things how do they relate based on the poem boom there's your theme mm -hmm. so just those singular abstract ideas and then you put them into a sentence there um, I do have a comment uh, in the chat here, Gina, that says, you know, how do I not just say the author uses imagery? I have a way to deal with that, but we're going to let you take this one first. Or, or, um, or any other device like that, by the way, like simile, metaphor, you know, parallel structure, sejura, and jam it, whatever. Yeah. I think the problem when you do that is you're kind of making the, that literary element your claim when instead you want to be treating it like your evidence. So if your claim was that the author um, feels he's been burned before and so he's mad at her and my evidence is that he's the, the scorched 
fly. Um, I wouldn't say the author uses personification by comparing himself to the scorched fly. I would say the personified scorched fly embodies his hurt feelings because she's burned him before. I just kind of sneak it in there and then it flows a lot better. So I've still said personification, but instead I've made it my, my verb. Um, and, and, and then it's a lot smoother to read. And then, you know, it's funny because I was going to I was going to give the same exact advice. We got to turn these lit devices into verbs. So somebody gave the gave, you know, um, what if you know the author uses imagery? I would actually tell my kids, I want you to write the author begins by describing and then put in what's actually described and then say in order to or suggesting that blank. So the author begins by describing blank suggesting that and then what's my interpretation that comes from that so you always put it together the what and the why is always together in that topic sentence that's mm -hmm. the first sentence of each body paragraph and if you take your literary devices that you know and you could turn them into verbs personification that's a great one uh, if you if you're looking at a simile well does that simile actually compare or does it contrast because we want to pick the better verb Oh, the author contrasts these images. And if you could turn those, those words into verbs here, folks, or the verbs that relate to them, you're going to have a better understanding of what's actually going on. Once I, mm -hmm. turned my, once I made my students write with verbs instead of actually just saying use as blank, it revolutionized how they wrote about poetry and prose every time. Every time. Um, let me see here. Any other questions? Um, uh, one thing is somebody asked about ordering paragraphs chronologically. I think we spoke about that pretty in depth where it's like, yeah, you should probably order it chronologically. However, I would suggest though, Gina, tell me if you disagree on this, right? Because it's very important. Um, sometimes there are question three prompts that don't jive with anything chronological. You know, pick a symbol, pick a, mm -hmm. you know, even this past one, right? Pick a home that represents something more. Right. And I know that my students wrote a lot about Jekyll and Hyde. And because of that, um, or they actually wrote about Frankenstein a lot and the monster living in a hovel, which actually yeah. represented him being longing to be with the family, but being outside the family and not, you know, able to ever go in. That's a singular moment in the book that they wrote about in different kind of moments there. So I tell my students, always write chronologically unless the prompt doesn't allow for it, because every once in a while there, there isn't a prompt that allows for it. What do you tell your kids? I think that specific, I think chronologically is good for Q1 and Q2. For poetry and prose, you've got the full text in front of you. Move through that chronologically for the most part. For Q3, um, this is really good too for keeping that line of reasoning in mind. I always tell them that a Q3 prompt has a big big picture and a little a little picture question. So the little picture question is that thing about like symbol or house or deception or gift that's the little one but the big picture question is how does it relate to the work as a whole they always throw that in there at the end so you're supposed to give those instances where there's a symbol or where there's a house or where there's a gift but the work as a whole is not necessarily showing me from beginning middle and end it's how does this gift at the beginning contribute to events at the end? Just yeah. make sure you're talking about events or significance or themes that can be tied throughout the entire work. And then you're still doing it. You're still covering the whole work, but you don't necessarily need to tackle it in a chronological way right. like you would Q1 or Q2. Right. Um, but, you know, chronology typically works you know, nicely. Somebody actually asked a question about conclusions about getting a little bit too advicey. Uh, so students, you know, kind of end with like, uh, uh, we all get heartbroken and whatnot. For me, with my students, I tell them when I when I tell them to teach it, when I teach conclusions, I tell them, you're going to take your thematic insight, and you're going to make it a universal practical application, right? So that can yeah. get advicey. But one of the ways that I stay away from it, is I say, you don't need, want to get advicey, you want to sound like you're a philosopher. But one of the best mm -hmm. ways to do it is to synthesize a meaningful three to five word quote in your last sentence. Um, and I, my kids will write a three sentence conclusion and it will knock your socks off every single time when they put a quote in there because it just flows so perfectly and they pick the one that conveys the theme the mm -hmm. most. And, you know, um, so like if we were to look at that poem for that he looked not upon her, my kids will write this whole conclusion. The very last sentence will be, you know, but let's be honest, what individual is not actually typically dazzled by their desires, period, mm -hmm. boom, we're done. And I get to the end of that and I'm like, oh, that, who's not right about that? I'm like, mm -hmm. I've felt that my entire life, you know, that kind of a thing. 
you know, being dazzled by desire. So uh, that's just a quick answer to that question. But we do have a conclusion video where I talk about conclusions, how to write them. I have conclusion videos for question one, two, and three um, in our guide there. Um, Jaden asks about writing in chronological order. Um, do you ha do you have stems for your kids to write in chronological order? Because I do, and I'll share them in just a minute. But do do you have a, like a way that you get kids to write chronologically or just to remember to do so? I don't. I just really try to emphasize the organization. And again, remembering to be talking about the whole piece, not just an individual. Um, I don't try to do too much with nitpicking the chron chronology. Most of my students do default to that generally. Um, I think that when you try to organize it in a non-chronological way, you just sound confused. You just sound lost. Um, like you started writing before you read the whole poem or then you read it again and you're like, ooh, something from stanza one, I like this. So um, I kind of just make it like, hey, don't even try it because you're just gonna come off sounding really, really confused. So just for quick tips, if anybody's looking for quick tips here, um, and um, Josh, I'm gonna answer your questions. You asked two really good questions in a minute. Quick tips. I tell my students, your first topic sentence, if you can write through a piece chrono chronologically, you have to start with author's name begins by. And then they have to then have at the end of that sentence suggesting that. So the author begins by blank, suggesting that blank. So they have an interpretation and something in the text. The next topic sentence, the author then shifts to blank, highlighting blank. So these are the stems that they use. And sometimes, though, it's not a shift. It's a contrast, So especially the poetry. So they might say the author then contrasts. So they have their option, shifts to or contrasts. And then they move to the next one, and they'll say the author finishes by. And then what are they doing? And then they'll say revealing that or illustrating that, and then they'll put theme right there. And then they've gone through chronologically. I know that they're hitting upon theme, and they know that they have some comforts to kind of fit back in for some really good um, – uh, some really good commentary because the topic sentences are, are well laid out. Um, and then um, Josh asked a question up here. Um, let me find it again. It was good. Okay. He actually says, you know, can you still get the points for literary devices if you never actually mentioned the literary device? And the answer is absolutely yes. That's why it says literary elements. Mm -hmm. And if I say, you know, uh, Tim and Gina, you know, were bickering on camera – uh, because, of course, we would totally do that, um, right? That's conflict. We don't have to say conflict, you know? And then when it's like Tim and Gina were bickering on camera and Tim came off as a wicked jerk, now we're tying conflict with characterization. Mm -hmm. And we didn't say either of those terms. So please note, those are absolutely literary elements there for sure. Um, There's a question about um, should I list literary uh, elements in your thesis? What do you tell students? So with the new, with the actual new um, rubric, right? The rubric, you'll get the thesis point as long as it responds to the prompt with a thesis that presents a, de a defensible interpretation of the poem. For question two, presents a defensible interpretation of the passage. And for question three, presents a defensible interpretation of the selected work. So what that really means is that with AP Lit in particular, you do not have to list them. Now, for my kids, I encourage them to because they're in a high stress time situation and I give them I give my kids a template that lays out everything for them in order. It's the concrete devices, the concrete and abstract complexities and then the universal insight. So it goes from concrete to concrete and abstract to fully abstract. That's their thesis template, but it also keeps their essay organized throughout. So in a high stress situation if they forget what they're doing, they go right back to their thesis and they're like, "Oh, Jiminy Cricket was right. Always let your thesis be your guide," you know? But if you don't want to list those elements out, you don't have to, as long as you are not just saying the author presents the complex attitude of this particular person or the complex conflict or whatever the prompt is asking you for. As long as you identify what the complexity is throughout the piece, the author presents the apprehensive and yet longing nature of a speaker who still desires his lover, though doesn't want to be hurt, ultimately illustrating blank, boom, thesis point. And that's really sophisticated. Like, it's good stuff. What about you? <laughs> that's the long answer. I'm sorry. What I, about you, Gina? No, that's okay. Um, I caution mine against it just because usually when they use the literary devices there, I get a thesis that says the author shows a complex relationship through simile, imagery, and personification. And then I get no complex, I get no no complex relationship. 
I get no reaction or interpretation whatsoever. And then they lose the thesis point. Yeah. Um, so I tell them more that the focus has to absolutely be defining that complexity. And then why should it, why should I care? What does it do? How does it drive the text? Whatever that is, is the line of reasoning. And then we go back to the sprinkling of the literary elements to put those throughout. If you can work those into the thesis along with the rest, you can, but I see no reason to have it in the thesis. It's definitely not a requirement. Yep. They, I mean, it's in here in the four point range for evidence and commentary. And that is the only other time that mentions literary elements. It's not in the thesis requirement at all. Right. So it doesn't need to be there. I agree. And you know, so I think that a lot of kids get confused because the rhetorical analysis thesis requirement says, does, does the thesis present rhetorical choices essentially? And so kids get kind of mm -hmm. used to that. Now, like I said, for me, yeah. I have a really complex thesis structure for my kids. So for, like when you said your problem with your kids would be like the author, you know, use a simile personification and whatever my kids will say oh the author compares this with this personifies this and you know um highlights an argument in order to showcase that the speaker is apprehensive and blah 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 so they'll label the complexity and mm -hmm. then they'll say ultimately illustrating and then they'll put their thematic statement but that's very different than so and so does a b and c in order to highlight the complex character of the speaker right. you know what right. i mean so yeah. um and this is not a one size fits all thing now, somebody up here did ask, what about adding high-level vocab? Um, how do you deal with high – like, should I just add high-level vocab to get the sophistication point? What do you think? I have a perspective on this, but I want to know what yours is. Okay, so I have lots of feelings about the sophistication point. And if you're trying really hard to get it, I can usually tell. Um, if you have not gotten the sophistication point so far this year – then don't worry about it. You can actually still score really high, even five range without ever earning a sophistication point. That's right. If you've been told your whole life that you're an incredibly gifted writer, oh my goodness, this vocabulary, where did it come from? It's so magical. Then yeah, you might be able to, be get, to get that sophistication point because you have found your writing voice that takes years for people to find. It's really, really amazing if you're 17 or 18 and you found it. I certainly hadn't. Okay. Oh, had so, no way. It, yeah. So it's, it's not something that you should feel like you have to jazz up with a thesaurus, every other word to make you sound fancier. It's just going to sound clunky. Um, if you can say, I mean, if you could say contrast or juxtaposition, when I, I mean, I love juxtaposition, right. but use it only if you use it really naturally and you know what you're saying. Don't try to sound smart if it's going to be risky and you're going to end up, saying something wrong because yeah. then we're going to be like oh they're trying hard it's not working <laughs> i know right and actually i think the most sophisticated papers intermix the colloquial language with that kind of you know uh better uh vocabulary so it's one of those things like i think that a lot of times kids think if you write all the way up here that it's like yeah. the best and it's not the best papers that have voice integrate a kind of more common language with also this kind of um, you know, esoteric vocab. Um, mm -hmm. And so because of that, it becomes incredibly effective um, for that. Uh, somebody asked a question about writer's block, and I'm going to just go back to what I mentioned earlier about turning the prompt into a question. That's mm -hmm. the easiest way to get past writer's block because if we have to find the complex attitude of this or the, or the care, you know, in order to convey the complex character of so-and-so, right? If you find that the character is, you know, um, happy, sad, and joyful all at the same time, you don't have to worry about writer's block. You know what you have to write about. How does the person begin happy and then get sad and then become joyful? There's your whole paper. Boom. Yep. That's it. So if you turn the prompts into a question, you don't have to worry about writer's block at all. And especially like like I said earlier, if you just have your thesis, which is the claim that's going to drive your paper, instead of a full intro paragraph, like a single sentence as your intro paragraph, totally cool, totally fine. You could still write an awesome paper with the, and even get the sophistication point. Um, with just your thesis as your intro. Not a problem. And it saves tons of time. And you don't have to worry about sitting there, how do I start my paper? Make yeah. your claim. You think the guy is longing, apprehensive, and yet still wants a lover. Boom. The author presents a man who is longing, apprehensive, but still wants a lover to illustrate this universal truth. There's your thesis. Off you go. And I think that also a benefit of you guys doing it digitally is 
you can go back and add things more naturally at the beginning that the handwritten folks can't. They have to do all the lines with the asterisks and everything. And with typing it all out, I mean, it's a little bit easier to edit it and organize it. So yeah. um, I was going to say the same thing as you, though. Always just return to your return to your thesis, return to your claim. You don't need to if you found yourself, you've written yourself into a hole and you don't know where to go. Go back and look at what you said for your thesis. You might have lost it somewhere along the way. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Sorry. I was getting lost in the comments there again. Trying no, to make fine. sure we Looking pick that all up. There, there we go. Right. Um, all right. Super cool. So give me like one of the major don't do this for poetry. And then we'll talk about um, I think we should t we should actually shift to question three because poetry and prose are answered the exact same They're way. So mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll talk about question three in a minute. But what's your what's your big don't do this for poetry and prose? Like, is there anything that you're like, just please don't? Um, I see a lot of misreadings, especially with with poetry, but equally with prose, with students who are trying to make their interpretation really, really special. Like maybe they're going for that sophistication point for an alternate reading. And so um, suddenly, oh, I got a, a lot of unique essays on the landlady. And one of them was that the landlady was um, a, a dog. And right. so it was, and, and I was like, okay, I understand like with the imagery, we can go with pet. Um, my rule of thumb with students, is the more outside the box your interpretation is, the more evidence you better have to support it. If it's really outside the box, you need at least three pieces of evidence, four if you can find it. If you can only hang your really unique interpretation on one piece of evidence, I don't think it's enough do and it. you risk having a misreading. And then depending on your reader, that could be really catastrophic to your score. Um, so I think that don't always be looking for that really clever reading of your poem. You don't need to interpret it into something totally new. You can take it at its face value like, oh, it's a landlady. Like, oh, it's a, it's a guy and he likes her, but he doesn't. And follow yep. that train. It's okay. It. to. It's, you can take a simple idea and you can complexify it with what you have in front of you. Perfectly. That's what you to do. I think that's the best advice I could possibly ever offer. And I'm not even going to try to follow that up. That is it. Here we go. Yeah. So there's your mic drop, and then we move on. <laughs> um, it's not, because well, we have to talk about Q3. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot, right? So Q3, last thing here, because don't forget, folks, Marco Learning, and there um, you can just YouTube search Marco Learning, uh, but the link is in the description right down below. Uh, they are at 9 o'clock are going to live stream, particularly help for the digital exam for tomorrow. They're going to focus on multiple choice, but they will cover everything else that we haven't covered. Um, so a huge shout out to them, okay? Um, and they're, they're great. They have tons of awesome free stuff. John is like the test master here. Who's going to be doing probably the, um, uh, parts of that live stream as well. So please, uh, consider checking them out. No, they're not paying us to say that. I really support John a ton. Um, and he actually supports the garden of English a lot as well, but all right, let's talk about question three, because once again, question one and question two are so similar. Tell me about question three. What are our do's and do nots for question three as we begin to wrap up here tonight? Um, for do. Think, think a bit before you commit to an answer. I hear a lot of students who are like, I saw Frankenstein on the list, so I started Frankenstein. And then half, like 10 minutes later, I realized I should have written about fences or something like that. Yeah. So so take a bit to really think, um, spend go, go back to spending a couple of minutes outlining. I've even seen students who've outlined like drafts for two different titles and then they pick between them. For don't, don't feel confined to the list. That is That's the right. biggest oh problem. Yes. People are like, I haven't read any of these. I'm a failure. And no, that's not it at all. Um, and then some people, they like with with the prompt two weeks ago about house, my students were like, Frankenstein's on the list. I couldn't do Frankenstein. And I was like, well, why not? We're, you know, you can be you. You can still write about it. And so even though the list is there, it always becomes a distraction. If you're reading it and you're going, oh, my gosh, beloved, 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 beloved. Don't even look at the list. If it's singing beloved for you, just go and start brainstorming your essay. The list is there. If you read through the prompt and you go, what? Nothing. I have nothing. There's you know nothing. Right. I, you know, I completely agree when kids harp on the book list there. And I, I make sure that my kids know every year. Now, another thing about the book list, and this is, this is advice that I'm going to give, and I'm going to give it reluctantly. But folks, write about a book that you know. And honestly, mm -hmm. if the giver works, write about the giver. Now, mm -hmm. um, I actually would, I think the giver is an incredibly complex book, even though it's considered a middle school book. I really do. I read it and I was like, this book is blowing my mind. Um, however, is that the best book to choose for your AP Wood exam? No. 
but you will be go you will be scored based on whatever book you write about. I had a kid who wrote an incredible Harry Potter essay. Now, do I want a Harry Potter essay if he can do Hamlet instead, or if he can do Beloved, or if he can do something? No, I want Beloved. I want you know something like that, right? But he blew me out of the water, mm -hmm. and he wrote about he wrote about it, and I was like, you know what? That was awesome, and and um, they will read your essay no matter what. And so if you're like, oh man, I do remember that I loved Hatchet. Well, you know what? My I one of my best friends just took a teacher exam and wrote about Hatchet and passed his exam with flying colors. When I took my teaching exam and I had to write my literary essay, I used Alice in Wonderland, and you guys can tell that I'm kind of a fan. But mm -hmm. um, right, I used Alice in Wonderland, passed it with flying colors. So if I'm doing, if I'm able to do that as a professional. You can write about that book on AP Lit if you want to. Um, now, is it better to use one of those better books? Of course, right, Gina? Let's be real. But I, do want, I don't want you all to be like, I can't think of a book besides Twilight. Well, if you only got Twilight, then write about Twilight. It's mm -hmm. going to be harder. I can't think of a book besides yeah. Hunger Games. Oh, I wish you didn't have to say that, but it is what it is. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I had a student who had a list. I make him come up with a study guide of five titles that are going to be their go-tos. And one had Hamlet and all the fancy titles. And then he goes, Ender's Game. And he goes, I could talk for days about Ender's Game. And I know that it's young adult. And I was like, put it on your list. I don't know if it should be your first choice. But it's probably the one you know the best. And he's like, I love Ender's Game. I can analyze it forever. And I said, have it on your list. And I kind of have a, a criteria for if, if it's AP worthy to analyze. One of them is, is it written for an adult audience? And what I mean by that is not like it has to be highbrow, but like, it was written with these themes in mind that adults can appreciate. Young adults can still be part of that. I think it. I think you should try to avoid a work in a series. No, nothing against Harry Potter. I have a whole Harry Potter section in my yeah. library. Here. The problem with a work in a series is that your work is not confined to a single book anymore. You've That's got right. seven books. I had to read an essay a few years ago about deception and they picked Severus Snape and my head exploded and I was so excited. But then I realized there's no way to write an essay about the deception of Severus Snape in 40 minutes. Yeah. It took her seven books to do it. You yeah. just can't, you have, you have the length issue. So a work in a series is risky for that. Then my other two rules, does it have a symbol? Does it deal with a political or a social issue? And yeah. if you can say yes to both of those, then I say you're golden. Yeah. And it, like like you said, go with what you know. If you're like Hamlet with the lady and the thing, well, it's not going to no, be I very great. Yeah, yeah, do the books that you know, you and then you'll, able, you'll do better. Yeah, you need to be able to describe it really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, another thing about that is um, – I, I, I love the idea of not choosing a book in the series unless you have to. Like I said, my advice was uh, if you have to. Yeah. Um, and, you, and I tell my kids, you got to talk about one book. You can't talk about the whole series. Like pick one book. Um, and my criteria for kids is this. They need to have a book that's full of drama, which honestly any book that we read is. They need to have a book in mind that is some sort of coming of age. And interestingly enough, this year, a lot of my kids were like, we just want to use Frankenstein as my coming of age novel. And I'm like, Victor? And they're like, no. Oh, the creature. Monster. Yeah. They were like the monster and how he had his epiphany of what this is like to be human. And mm -hmm. I was like, you all are awesome. So mm -hmm. I tell them, you need to have a book that's full of drama, one that has coming of age, and one that deal that has a moment that is funny. Now, that doesn't mean that it has to be like laugh out loud funny, but it has to be a moment where you're like, I can see so much irony that even if I were disturbed, I could be like, it's almost funny how this happened, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because of that, I've only ever seen one humor prompt for a question three. But it and did it, throw people. Right, and it threw people for a loop because it was a moment of thoughtful laughter. So that means yeah. it didn't have to actually be funny, but it had to make you think to the point. And, and, and whenever anything's funny, it's just ironic. Yeah. So any moment of irony, but I'm like, you got to pick out one where you're like, that moment right there, hysterical. Macbeth does not fit that. No. You know? Maybe when he goes crazy at the banquet and he, he, you know, he sees Banquo's ghost and you're like, it's hysterical because he's making a fool of himself in front of everybody when he wants to be this amazing king that's full of power. But that's pushing it. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. So I always say try to find a book where there's that one moment that you're like, that was hysterical and you have that to hang on to. But I do like that idea of the symbol as well. Now, uh, you know what, Gina? I'm going to ask you a question. If you were a betting person, what do you think tomorrow's Q3 is going to be? I really don't know. I did not see the one about the house coming. Oh, um, oh my gosh. So just real quick, I have to interrupt. 
I actually have been talking about that with my kids all year. Really? I was like, I really think that this would be the case. And my kids came out of the exam and they're like, we can't talk about the test for you for two more days. But all I'm going to mm-hmm. tell you was when I saw that question three, I just sat there and laughed. And I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, I can't tell you. And then I saw the question three. I gave them that exact prompt really? like all year. They were like, who would have thought? Anyway, sorry. Yeah. What's your guess? I don't know. I've always wondered if it would be something that kind of focuses like on food. Um, It would be kind of interesting where like a meal, I mean, I just, we do how to read literature like a professor and all of the thing about like the significance of a meal. So maybe a a prompt, something to do with a meal or food could be really interesting. And I feel like that could pull from a lot of different genres. So I guess that's my bet. Right. And so just so we all know, this is just conjecture here from two ridiculous English lit yeah, AP lit geeks. So if here. I'm 100% right, that's just prophecy. I don't right, know. Right, right. Well, it's, speaking of prophecy, I think it's going to be a foreshadowing prompt. Oh, I haven't seen a foreshadowing prompt in a really long time. Okay. Um, so now we've got our bets out there. But anyway, well, let's get back to the actual content of question three because we've only got like five more minutes here. So okay. approaching question three, sorry about that. Uh, you know, we, we kind of geeked out a little bit, uh, but we did give some tips there. Um, the question that we actually have here is how would we attack question three differently than question two? And can we kind of explain the differences there? Um, Gina, why don't you start and I'll, and I'll finish this one. Yeah, I would say the main difference between question three from questions one and two is that you don't have the text in front of you. Um, with questions one and two, you're expected to be quoting from that text as your evidence. With question three, there you are not expected to do that. And so your evidence is going to be broader, but you're also pulling from an entire scope of a full work, which you're not doing for the other two. So your evidence and co- your evidence is just going to look a little bit different, but your your thesis and your commentary and the sophistication point, pretty much all the rest is yeah. the same. I think it's just that your evidence doesn't need to be in quotes. That's yeah. really the main difference. Right. And you're, so you're right. Absolutely. The textual evidence is that really detailed summary that you're providing. Mm-hmm. And I tell my students, you write your topic sentence with your claim and the why. Mm-hmm. And then um, so my students for this for this house prop that came through. Right. Uh, they probably they probably started with Je- with uh, Robert Louis Stevenson describing the door of Hyde's place to uh, to illustrate or to compare to Hyde's um, terrible or evil character, right? The damaged door illustrates his evil character. They would describe the door four sentences max with the best verbs they possibly yes. can. And yes. then they explain how their description of the door conveys his evil character. Mm-hmm. It's then, really, right. it's easier to slip into plot summary on yes. Q3 because of that. Okay. Sorry, keep going. No, 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 no. So, no, that's exactly right, right? That's exactly right. So Josh asks in the intro, is it good to have a historical context, right? Once again, Josh, for me and my students, never write a full intro. It's just the thesis because that's really what we're getting for. But Josh, if you have a, if you have a knowledge of that historical context so you can kind of build that into what the author's doing, you do that. You mm-hmm. be you. Like this is not a, hey, I'm going to just do it Freitas' way or just do it Gina's way. Josh, be you. Be mm-hmm. confident and know Part of sophistication is, is bringing things into a broader context. You might be able to write a killer intro that allows you to do that. But I don't want you to sacrifice your evidence and commentary to write – like think about this. Evidence and commentary is four points. Sophistication is only one. Right. I'd rather you get the thesis, the evidence, and commentary. So for a five out of six as opposed to I got my thesis out, I got one body paragraph, and I got my sophistication point. But you lost out on two commentary points. Like, mm-hmm. that. oh, no, we don't want that. You know. Yep. So think about it in that way. Um, so – um, hey, Matt has a question. If they memorize quotes, would that make their paper better? I don't see how it could hurt it unless you got the quote wrong or you yeah. do it too much. Yeah. Um, but- and on it, I do find that the more succinct the quote you've got memorized, actually the better it is. When they ramble off several sentences, then I'm like, what's going on? Um, but like – you know, Big Brother is watching or something like that. When you can just say like 124 is spiteful and you just you you work yeah. that in somehow, then I'm like, hmm, makes me feel really nice. So right. a short, succinct one is is kind of nice, but it's not required. I tell my kids throughout the year to write down those meaningful snippets of quotes and put yeah. them put them in your wallet, you know, in your and I tell them that's gonna be the last that that quote's gonna go in the last sentence of your conclusion of that essay. Yeah. So they have these really meaningful works, right? Like um you know, Jekyll and Hyde, man is not is not one, but two. And so they finish with, mm-hmm. you know, the blah, 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 right? And it reminds people that, boom, quote, man is not one, 
but two. And too bad the yeah. one who always wins is the evil one. Period. Boom. Like, it's like, oh, that's so sick. So, uh, but that yeah. is... That's... Yeah, if you can work in for, for a really great moment like that, then then do it. But it's not a requirement at all. When we say evidence for Q3, it is not quotes because we know you don't have the book in front right. of you. And so because of that, it's this great summaries. And for those of you that are watching, I really encourage you to pick out three books tonight on Spark Notes and go read the Spark Notes so that they're really fresh in your mind. Definitely. Look over the setting too. People always forget... People forget the character's name, they forget the author's name, and they forget where it's set. And then you'll find that you surprisingly needed to know that information. Know, it's a good I, thing to brush up on. Gina, I talk too much, and I'm sorry, but I appreciate your expertise. And I'm so thrilled that you were willing to hang out with us for about an hour and a half. I'm going to encourage you all to leave here and go to Marco. Gina, any any finishing words here as we, as we uh, close up shop? Yeah, something that I don't think students know enough is that the readers are told to reward you for what you do well. Yeah. And we are told specifically not to penalize you for what you do poorly. We are rooting for you. So if you're like, if you do something and it's awkward, but then you do something that and it sings, we are more likely to reward you for the singing than to penalize for the awkward. Okay, we, we're nerds. We celebrate in great analysis. We celebrate in great writing. And so if you're doing that well and you do something really well, we want to reward you for it. Absolutely. Okay, just know that your readers, we're rooting for you when we score your essay, even if we're tired. I know, right? And exhausted, absolutely. And, you know, my final words for you all is this. You are so much more than a number. Like mm -hmm. AP Lit is about understanding what it means to be human and what it means to be have complex interactions in life. And if you are like, I want to identify myself with a five on my AP Lit exam or a four or whatever, right? Don't. Be more human. And if you can leave this course and you're like, I am a better writer, I can be more empathetic. I want you to hold on to that. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what's meaningful that comes from this course. So fine. You can write a little better. Super cool. But I care that you know more about you. And I know that you care more about uh, other people that are around you and you know how to relate to them better. And you can look for their experiences and see how you can relate. And that's the best advice that I can give you. So, um, Gina, I really appreciate you a lot. And I appreciate you taking your time out from your family to be here tonight. I appreciate everybody that tuned in. Um, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, please remember to uh, subscribe to the Garden of English. Check out AP Lit and more. There is some student-centered stuff there. And we're going to try to get Gina on the... You know, I'm going to try to convince you to create a YouTube channel, Gina, and then we'll get everybody subscribing to you. And you can I had to create it to put comments in here, so maybe I'll throw some junk on there. I there, don't know. There we go. So thank you all so much. It was super nice to see you all. Gina, thank you so much again for joining up, and I hope you all have a great night. Thanks, Tim.